Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we've got the Blackhawks struggling, and the Bears are who that we thought they were. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly, affordable prices. Uh, located just 90 minutes from the city limits, fun for the whole family. Uh, they've got games this week, Wednesday, uh, against the uh, Iowa Wild, and then Saturday against Grand Rapids. Um, so head on over to icehogs.com, get some tickets for those games, and a hat, shirt, jersey, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Oh, Alex. I was really... I was really hoping we would have a completely different conversation today than we are about to have. Yeah. um, To say the least, I was hoping for a victory Monday. I was hoping that we would have some fun, but I think instead we are going to be doing a lot of venting. And I think there are some, uh, strong things we'd like to say about the state of the team. Um, yeah. Do you have a preference of where you want to start with this team? Or should we just start pointing fingers and, and being angry? <laughs> well, I think um, everything that we have to say does involve the pointing of fingers and the angry emotion. Um to certain degrees of very angry and extremely angry. Let's kind of put it in that range. Um, I think the point I'd like to start with is this loss took away any possibility of respectability for the Chicago Bears this season. Instead of one game under 500. They're now three and six. And I think this game was the big tipping point of the season and they lost it. Yeah. I, I made, I angrily made notes as normally I'll have like talking points about the game. <laughs> so did I. That's so funny. And, and I don't even want to discuss the game for the most part, you know, for a few things here and there, but mostly I just want to talk about the state of the bears. And I made, I made like this multi-page notes because and you sort of touched on one is, you know, building on yours is not only is this a tipping point and they lose respectability, but this loss almost assuredly guarantees they're going to be last place in the division again, because they are yeah. now two, two full games in the standings behind the Packers. And since they are 0-2 against the Packers this year, uh, that essentially makes them three games back of the Packers because they'd have to overcome that tiebreaker. Yeah, and I mean, let's let's face it. With the way things are going now, I don't really expect them to beat Detroit next week, so that's going to push you back even further. Yeah, I agree. It's hard to not see the Bears finish last. It would have to take a pretty good collapse from either the Packers or the Lions to not finish last. Um, you know, the Bears may win a few more games, but yeah, I, I think it pretty much cements the basement. Yeah, I mean, I, I fully expect the Packers to, to nosedive from here, but... That not to the extent that the Bears are going to be able to catch them. Right, right. Yeah, that's they they've dug their hole and they're sticking in it. Yeah, and I I just want to re- assure every single person that's listening to the show right now is Brett Hundley is not a good quarterback, and you didn't see him suddenly come of age against the Bears 
It's the Bears played terribly and let a terrible quarterback win that game. He's an awful quarterback. And next week, who I think they have their bye next week, but um, or this coming week. But after that, you're going to see him be terrible against every other team they play, and uh, they're they're going to struggle and they're going to lose another you know multi game set in a row. Um, but the Bears aren't going to be able to win enough games to catch them in the standings. No. And I mean, right now, I think it's safe to say this is the Minnesota Vikings division. I think that I wouldn't say it's clinched or wrapped up, but, you know, I think that they have really good control of this division. And obviously the Bears are on the opposite end. Um, let me just say how shocked I am that a team that had a bye week, that had two weeks to prepare, Against the team that is without its top two running backs because they both went down yesterday and without arguably the best football player on the planet. You had two weeks to prepare for this game. You looked lost. You were undisciplined. You were all over the place. I just, what the hell? <laughs> you touched on points 12 and 13 on my list. Number 12. Uh, Perfect. How, how many how many pre snap penalties can the Bears have in the, two in a row without even is. snapping the damn ball? They had they had a delay of game on an extra point. How does the that most, happen? The most gimme play in all the sports, and they botch it. Uh, and so, and then point thirteen is the Green Bay Pack. Not only did the Bears have a two weeks to prepare for this. They're coming off of their bye. They are playing the Packers, who went from arguably the best, if not the best, probably second best quarterback in the NFL to probably, man, there's some really bad quarterbacks right now, arguably one of the worst quarterbacks. And they're coming off of a short week. They, they played a tough game against the Lions. Short week rest, like you said. And the Bears couldn't do anything. Uh, here is what I don't know if this is on your list or not, but I'm going to mention this. Uh, one play that I think isn't, or I should say two plays that are not being talked about enough was on the first Packers drive of the game. Kyle Fuller had what should have been sure interceptions just dropped twice. Yeah, the secondary didn't have a good game. No, and you know you know what we saw? Brett Hundley and his practice squad team do that didn't have a line, that didn't have their real running backs in, that didn't have Aaron Rodgers in. They still were able to spread the ball around more than the Bears did. And that's because they have a real offensive coordinator. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you'll touch on this later, but um, a few stats I kind of want to go off that. Um, and, and again, tell me if this is on your list or not. Here are two key things I want to touch on. Adam Shaheen had that great play. Remember that early on in the game? Yes. He got He was thrown at what, two times the whole game? Yeah, that's point number six. There you go, point number six. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. I love this. Adam Adam Shaheen had 39 yards receiving in the first quarter, and then he didn't get a target for the rest of the game. Why? This, this is your your tight end, your tight, supposed tight end of the future with your quarterback of the future. They should be playing together as much as possible to build that rapport because, the, as the old saying goes, a young quarterback's best friend is a tight end. Yeah, especially in a passer's game like this day and age. It's essential. The other especially piece... When, especially when your you know, real starting uh, tight end is out for his career. And right. Your, your other... Big free agent uh, tight end is out due to mystery illness and hasn't practiced in two two weeks. Yeah, what is wrong with Deion Sims? Nobody knows. Maybe, you know, there's people that know, but nobody in the public seems to know. 
John Foxitis or something. Um, the other one I want to share is, oh, Mr. Human Joystick, supposed to be a big playmaker. What? 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 One rushing attempt and one carry? Or one 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 rushing attempt and one catch? That's it? What 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 the hell? Why isn't he playing? This isn't just yesterday. The past few weeks, he's they've they've done nothing with him. What's with that? Could this you explain that to me, please? This is point number seven. All right, what? so I got so I got <laughs> twelve and thirteen and six yeah. and seven. You got six, seven, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's seven. three. That's a turkey. Why does the most explosive offensive player the Bears have only get two touches in a game? <laughs> Why? It, the past few weeks he hasn't. What? I don't. I just. I don't get it. I mean, do you have a logical answer? Because I sure hell don't. And I mean, I get why if you're not going to give him a lot of touches as running back because you don't want to get him beat up. But you know what is is he has good hands. He can run right. good routes. And mm-hmm. and which leads to point number eight is Marcus Wheaton got two snaps in this game. So clearly, and clearly you don't have wide receivers, is why not put him at at least wide receiver? Or like some sort of pick bubble screen. Uh, right. Get get you don't have to put him in there all the time, but Tariq Cohen needs to get the ball more than two, uh, two touches in a game. He needs exactly. to, especially especially when you lose by a touchdown. You we just listed two essential key guys for the future: Adam Shaheen and Tariq Cohen. These are two essential guys with. Their quarterback of the future. How are you supposed to work through things and develop when you don't use it? Uh, would you like? Would you like to see if you can get another one on the list? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, eleven penalties in the first half. Bad. Yes. Bad. 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 And uh, it, I, I'm sure that's on your list somewhere in some form. It is. It's point sixteen. 16, all right. Uh, let's see. We talked about Kyle Fuller. Um, I just wanted to touch on Trubisky himself. Um, I'm sure this is on your list somewhere. Uh, I thought he was okay. Uh, obviously, he had a lot of passing yards, nearly 300. He was 21 for 35. There were some drop passes. But boy, oh boy, he has got to improve on picking up pressure. Yeah, that goes to point number 11. Um, which is a multi, it's actually a multifaceted point. Uh, the Packers sacked Trubisky five times in the game. Lost in for their 29 previous, yards. In their previous three games, the Packers had combined two sacks. Are you uh, kidding? Oh. Uh, so I wrote, the game plan needs to help Trubisky to make quicker decisions. Sure, I give part of this to Trubisky, but you know what? He's in his, what, 17th game post high school? Is yeah. you need you need to game plan him to to help him do that is if that is you know limiting his options. Uh, I mean, part of this is <laughs> I I would I would put more max protect plays in. Is he a it has less people for him to throw it to, and b it keeps him from getting sacked. It gives him longer in the pocket. And yeah, I mean, there's there's no question that uh, the line was not very good yesterday. Uh, blocking really struggled, and um, I, I feel like as good as Josh Sitton is as a player, he's kind of slowing down a bit and not as efficient. But I mean, it's not just on him. Overall, the line did not play very good yesterday. But you know, it's kind of an offensive effort. Um, but you know, hey, at least at least he threw for a bunch of yards. Right? I mean, we can take that away as a plus. Yeah, it's something. And um, kind of <laughs> related to that, uh, let's see if this is on your list. This is the one somewhat positive thing I have. Other than the dropped pass on the final drive, uh, Dontrell Inman looked pretty good. That's point nine. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know much more to say about that, but overall, I think he was a good pickup. It, uh, absolutely. I mean, for what you could get at the time, probably the best option. Oh, uh, for I prob- sure. 
I, I may have put a little more negative spin on it though, is uh, my point number nine is Dontrell Inman was another team's trash, but is far and away the best wide receiver uh, that we have right now. Let that sink in. Eh, you're not wrong. You're really not wrong. And that's not a knock on, on him. He, I thought he played well. Um, he's, he's got talent, but he was, he was a guy that couldn't make, get the field for a not good San Diego chargers team. Uh, and, and the bears were able to pick him up and. Well, as long as it gives you something rely, somewhat reliable to throw down field, I mean, it's some progress, but how can you call it much progress when you still can't spread out your game plan like we've been talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's just, it's really frustrating. Um, you know, it's our offensive coordinator had two weeks to come up with a game plan to face a Packers defense that has really struggled against the run. And I get that you've been able to run very well, but you have to, if you're Dow Loggins you, and John Fox, you have to look at this game going, all right, Dom Capers has made a career of eating young quarterbacks alive. So you have to assume that Dom Caper is going to do everything in his power to stop the running plays and make Mitch Trubisky uh, that Mitch Tr Trubinsky. Trubinsky. Uh, hashtag Trubinsky. Uh, they they were going to make him win this game, and they were going to do as much as they could to confuse him. And Dow Logans had no answer for a question that was obviously, or a problem that was obviously going to uh, occur. That's what is makes me angry. It, it's like, it says to me that a team has two weeks to prepare and you're not willing to make much adjustments. You can say, oh, well, we have Dontrell Inman. We could throw downfield a little more. Yeah, okay. But uh, there's a bit more of adjusting than just that. And, and is, you know, Dontrell Inman's a nice pickup, but he's not he's not the, the field stretcher like Marcus Wheaton was supposed to be. So he's... Uh, he's not going to stretch the field. You, it's you're gonna you're gonna be doing these m like short and mid routes. You're not going to be doing deep routes, and for the most part, that's been the best touch that that Trubisky has had is on these longer passes. Yeah, I mean he's looked great on the long passes. I mean his best pass of the game was probably I'd argue the touchdown pass to Josh Bellamy. I mean that was. Like I said, I bet that I would say that that was his best pass of the game. I'm not sure if he had another one in mind, but that's what I would have said. Yeah. So, it, I mean, Dow Loggins was as safe of a pick to be offensive coordinator as could be, and which is just sums up John Fox's entire career is let's play it safe and, and, not take any risks and you mediocre you can't is okay. play safe when you're trying to develop. You just can't. Which sort of leads to point 10 is John Fox is an absolute detriment to Mitchell Trubisky. If for nothing else is in this league, you learn from your mistakes. And if you are coaching your player to avoid any sort of mistakes and play a safe game uh, all you're doing is setting him up for failure is after the game, Mitch Trubisky was talking about how he was holding the ball too long, partially because he was, he didn't want to make a mistake in the throws. And that's, that's a John Fox burning into his head is, you know what? I don't want to see him throw interceptions, but I would rather see him throw an interception uh, because he misjudged how fast a cornerback can close rather than him hold the ball too long, waiting for some magical wide receiver that we don't have to open up, uh, get wide open and throw him a pass deep that I would much rather, because then you go back and you look at the film and say, you know what? I see now that how fast that guy can close. So he baited me. I get that. I'm never going to do that again. Uh, as opposed to, you know, what John Fox is beating into him is 
playing it safe, playing it safe, playing it safe. And you know what? The more you think about it and the more you hear it, the more it, it just pisses you off as a fan. I mean, look, this season is lost. It's not like they're going to go anywhere in the playoffs or whatnot. It, they're not. There is absolutely no reason why the Bears shouldn't just go out and try everything known to man and let Trubisky just do things. If you want to do a simple route, do a simple route. If you want to try to make things complicated, try to make things complicated. If it's risky, so the heck what? Just do it. Let him show you every bit of potential. This coaching staff is not letting us see every bit of his potential. And that is going to reflect a lot on his play when he's not getting a chance to show his full potential. And you know what? If you throw a lot, you're you're going to get intercepted more. Look at some of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. I had the same conversation with my college friends the other night. More quarterbacks who throw more, throw more interceptions. Look at Brett Favre. Look at Peyton Manning. When you throw more, you're more susceptible to it. But you know what? You still can make it work. Because interceptions are this whole judgmental bugaboo. It's like, oh, if he throws an interception, he's bad. Well, not necessarily true. Obviously, if you're throwing more interceptions and touchdowns and completions, yeah, that's bad. But it's this whole thing of safe, safe. Don't want to get intercepted. Safe. Let him throw. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're a 32-year-old quarterback and you're throwing a bunch of interceptions, yeah, that's terrible. If you're a 22, 23-year-old quarterback and you throw interceptions, that's called the learning process. Uh, I, I look at everyone's, you know, darling uh, is Deshaun Watson. Is that game before he blew his knee up, uh, he threw four touchdown passes. And everybody will tell you about those four touchdown passes, but they won't tell you about the three interceptions he threw that game. Yes. And you know, thank you. Oh my God. Why won't people understand that? Is you gave him a chance and sure, he made a bunch of mistakes, but you gave him the opportunity to make up for it. Is he threw interceptions, but he threw more touchdowns than interceptions. And that is called, you know, him learning on the job is what they do to Mitch Trubisky is, is a detriment to him. And I, you know, there's, there's people out there that are coddling him. There's people out there that are lambasting Mitch Trubisky, but you know, I can't even judge the kid because they've put zero talent around him and they have a offensive coordinator who should go back to being a quarterback coach because that's that's the level where he should be. Um, and you have a, a head coach who's notorious for have safe quarterback play with no rocking the boat and no going out there and, and winning. He was able to win with team, Tim Tebow because he played it safe and ran the ball and let the defense win. Is John Fox is a detriment. And it goes you know, back I just, also I just to, tweeted that out because I think that's a great quote. Uh, is, um, you know, this reminds me, one of my biggest criticism of the Emory Trustman era was everybody had a job that was at least one level higher than they have ever coached. At least one level higher. And that is not a recipe for winning. If you look at the Minnesota Vikings on their staff, they have three former head coaches. Not they didn't ever didn't promote everybody to a higher position. Sure, at some point somebody's got to get a promotion. But if you promote everybody at the same time to a job that they've never done, that's more that they don't have the qualifications for, is they you it's a recipe for disaster. And Dow Logans was not ready to be a NFL offensive coordinator for a winning program with a young quarterback with no talent, and there he's showing it. John Fox is supposed to be this guy who's a statesman of the league and knows all these people, and he couldn't reach out and bring in somebody else. He couldn't bring in <laughs> a, a experienced offensive coordinator. I mean, he brought Adam Gase, and Adam Gase did well considering, um, you know what, why couldn't you go and bring somebody else like that? Yeah. I mean, I, I dream of 
Adam Gase somehow becoming our head coach because I think that'd be awesome, but, you know, can't dream now. But, yeah, I just – this coaching staff isn't right for this kind of stage the Bears are in. And I think I'm pretty confident that Ryan Pace knows that. This just gets into my whole question of – how does Ryan Pace control this coaching staff? Does Is John Fox's status with the team a Pace thing or is it a McCaskey thing? If, let's say, Pace wants to give Fox the boot, does he have to go through the McCaskies and get their approval? Because that's what it sounds like from some people, but nobody really knows for sure, which gets into this whole other problem of, how much power does each person in this organization have when there's a question like that, things usually don't tend to work right. Yeah. I mean, they made it or when there was all the rumors about, um, uh, Bill Polian coming in and being an advisor is, uh, McCaskey, um, Jordan McCaskey came out and said, no, is Ryan Pace is in charge of all football operations. Uh, anything football related, he's in fully in charge, whatever he wants to do. But then it came out that he talked, he had to talk to George McCaskey about trading up to get Mitchell Trubisky. And, and now you're hearing stories of Virginia McCaskey is very upset about this, you know, loss. And the last time we heard that she was upset was after the back-to-back 50 point games in the Tressman era. So that was know, 2014. Yeah, and that made me really question whether or not that's truly the case that Ryan Pace is fully in charge if if these stories are correct. Um and, but John Fox can't be on steady ground. John Fox has to be on as shaky a ground as you know, I think the only person on in football that is on on more shaky ground is uh McAdoo in in the Giants. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and so, and that is a disaster. Uh, the John Fox is, is only probably more secure than him. I mean, maybe on equal footing is Hugh Jackson in Cleveland, but that's it. That 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 is as unsafe a ground as you can be on right now if you're John Fox. Yeah, no, I mean, what I said about yesterday's loss was is that John Fox was hanging on to the Bears. What was left was a microscopic thread. And to me, that microscopic thread was just snipped after that loss. I think that just, yeah. it should be fate sealing right there. Yeah, I actually read a quote from somebody that said, uh, John John Fox was hanging on by a mime string. <laughs> so it's basically <laughs> an invisible string. Yeah, that's why I, it, make, it clicked when you said that. Um, and, you know, I... I and, this was my point one, and I, it was just probably because it's the most uh, you know, talked about one. But regardless of whether or not there was enough evidence to overturn the call on the field on the John Fox's challenge, why did John Fox stop his offense from running up to the line of scrimmage confidently to run a play? Uh, to make a quick snap to make that dumb challenge. And I get that there's a person in the booth who's watching the replay that comes down to John Fox's ear, but John Fox is the head coach. And John Fox has a history of just absolutely awful timing for for uh, um, coach challenges. And that was a terrible one. Is What purpose was that? Is you know, you were going to get the ball really darn close to the goal You were on the, the two-yard line. line. It was first and goal. Just just go forward with it. I mean, oh, God. Uh, that that really, really, really boggled my mind. Yeah, that was – I mean, I think it was a bad uh, – I don't, I don't think there was enough to call it a fumble when that was – you know, there was a – when you go by, um, you know – clear and overwhelming evidence. I don't think there was enough there, but uh, you know, that that was a dumb challenge. And if you would have, if you would have just let it go and taken your first and goal and uh, you probably would have gotten a touchdown in there. And that's the difference in the game. John Fox 
botched that badly. Yeah, and uh, now there are numerous videos on Twitter of that with the Curb Your Enthusiasm theme playing. And, uh, you know, I think that goes to show uh, what that decision was like. But I don't know if you heard any of, like, the the presser uh, afterwards, any of the Bears presser after the game. The way John Fox was trying to, like, describe it, to me, it, just, like, the tone and the way he was kind of going, oh, you know, uh, it just, it seemed like he knew he screwed up. And though he said, you know, it's on me and we wish it could have gone another way, I think he really knows that he really screwed the pooch on that one. Because he did screw the pooch. He he should know it because he did it. Yeah. I, I'm just saying, you know, there, there are some people who, you know, don't take any responsibility or, you know, don't, you know, think that they're responsible. But he clearly knew that that was not good. Yeah, it's it's pathetic. Um, and this was a random point, and I'm just going to try to shoehorn it in right now. It's point number 15. Uh, John Fox has 11 wins in over two and a half seasons with the Bears. 11 wins in two and a half seasons. And only, what, three in division? Something along those lines. Because last year, uh, they beat the Lions and the Vikings, and the year before that, they beat the Packers. I think those are the only divisional wins that they've had. Yeah, because they haven't won one this year yet. Nope. And... Because they're on three. Right. And most of the wins in 2015 were against either AFC teams or the NFC West, I believe. It was just that Packers win on Thanksgiving. Uh, let's see. We've touched on most of my points. I've got a couple left here. It is point two. The defense sucked. Only yep. two three and outs uh, against a team with a dog turd quarterback and Brent Hundley in there. Two three and outs. You did more than that against Cam Newton. Secondary looked bad, as you said. Um, the pressure wasn't there uh, like it has been in the past. I think missing Trevathan was pretty big. Um, we saw big differences between him being in there and him not being in there. Uh, I mean, look at that play when, who was it? Uh, Jordy Nelson just kind of ran past the line and got into the end zone. Or was that Ty Mon it, it was somebody. But they just ran straight line into the end zone uncontested. And you know, you didn't see that the past few weeks. Yeah. Uh, Kyle Fuller got picked on um, most of this game and really had a hard, hard time covering Devontae Adams. Um, the Bears – let's see, cross that point off. <clears throat> the Bears got next to zero pressure from their front seven. Uh, and Vic Fangio had to dial up blitzes to get pressure. Um, and this included Leonard Floyd struggling against backup offensive linemen. Did that really, that really surprise me? Yeah. So the Bears defense, I mean, just imagine if that would have been Aaron Rodgers out there. Ugh, ugh. The way the Bears defense played. That's probably a 41 10 blowout. Yeah, probably. Because that that would be the point where Mitch Trubisky would have to start firing up 47 passes in a row, and then they get a pick six, and then, you know, ah, then we start seeing memes. The new Jay Cutler, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, at least there wasn't that. <laughs> bright side. Uh, yeah, bright side. Uh, so the Bears defense just didn't come out to play, and it, they just looked so flat. And, and then this one goes against, you know, right against Dow Loggins again, this next point is the green for the one team is on their third string running back. The other team prides itself on, on being a run first team and, and really establishing the run. Guess which team ran 35 times for 144 yards and guess which team ran 17 times for 55 yards. Somehow the Packers did the first and somehow the bears did the second. Yep. How do you run 17 times if you're a running team? How? 
I don't know. I don't know. And again, this comes back to my point about Tariq Cohen. Where is he? Why aren't you utilizing him more? You also have Benny Cunningham, which obviously his play was negated by the challenge. But still, I mean, Benny Cunningham is a solid third string guy. You could utilize, you have a chance to utilize three guys, and you didn't. Instead, you're just going to kill Jordan Howard. Yeah, it, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. I just, um, I, I don't get what they're so afraid of. You have to, they do they not see how this conservative play safe calling isn't doing anything? Do they not see that? I don't, I, I, I don't even know. I would love to be a fly on the wall and hear what, what goes on in Hallis Hall because if they are okay with what goes on here, then they've got to be certifiable. Is this is not okay? Is is I mean, there's one thing with being not good enough to do your job and you're not qualified, but you at some point, I, I mean, I'm I'm not a professional, and I could walk in there and I feel like I could devise a better game plan than what Dal Logan's has and. John Fox just is perfectly fine letting it go as it is. Uh, I, what does he do? Is Vix Clangio clearly controls that defense. Dow Logans apparently has free reign on the offense. John Fox just sits down and just rambles on the sideline and, and, and yells at referees. Yeah. Uh, that's, it's like you said, I'd love to be a fly in the wall and hear their conversations. I mean, if something's not working, you typically try to arrange things. And look, you can say they won those two games in a row against the Ravens and against uh, the Panthers, but consistent problems of lack of offensive production, and you don't change anything. You don't use a bunch of young weapons you have. You don't look for their full potential. And I will tell you this, we are coming up well, well, we're at the half point way of the season already. And your schedule is going to see some not so great defenses uh, in, like, say, the Browns and, you know, all that stuff. The 49ers. The 49ers, too. I, I, I would love, love, love to see if they make any sort of adjustment. Because right now, it just it seems like they don't want to. Yeah, I just, <clears throat> I don't get it. Um, you're, you're, as an organization, you are fine with two awful tackles and two injured guards and a crappy backup center. You're fine with that. You were fine with, and, and this is going to go back. I supported when Brandon Marshall got dealt, I felt that was the right move. I supported when Martellus Bennett got moved was the right move. I questioned a little bit, but I sort of understood where they were coming from with letting Alshon Jeffrey go. But the big problem is you can let these guys go to do addition by subtraction, but you have to find a way. You have to have an answer when you do this of how are we going to replace the talent? How are we going to replace the productivity? And they haven't done that is they've decided that they were going to uh, ride out Kevin White suddenly coming into his own, and they were going to ride out Cam Meredith. Uh, was he an undrafted rookie or undrafted player? And they were going to ride him to be their number one quarterback or a wide receiver. That was their plan, is when they would let Al, uh, Alshon Jeffrey go, is when they let Brandon Marshall go, it was, we're going to ride Alshon Jeffrey. And when they let Alshon Jeffrey go, we're going to ride Kevin White and Cam Meredith. And One's injury the prone, the other out. was, what, undrafted, like you said? When you got rid of Martellus Bennett, you went with uh, uh, Zach Miller, and he got injured. Deion Sims' mystery illness. And it just, you've got to have guys that that you can rely on. Sammy Watkins was available this season in a trade. And I get it. You don't want to give up draft picks because they're they're valuable. But you know what? 
you get Sammy Watkins for a mid-round draft pick. What are the odds that you're going to bring in somebody as good as Sammy Watkins with a mid-round, was it a second or third round pick? You're not yeah, going to like probably that. get, you're not going to get a guy like that. Sure, you're going to have to pay Sammy Watkins a big mm-hmm. amount of money, but you've got so much money to spend as the Bears. Plenty of money. Yeah, exactly. Is You bring him in and you let your future franchise quarterback throw to a guy that's an NFL caliber receiver. And that's what happens is um, then you can still make that Dontra uh, Inman trade because it was a seventh round pick, conditional seventh round pick. Is you then that makes him that much better, which makes uh, Kendall Wright that much better, which makes you know everybody down the line that much better because instead of being a one, then they get to be a two, and the guy that's now a two gets to be a three, and you downgrade everybody else and it improves your overall talent level and the bears just aren't doing that yeah you hit the nail on the head right there you hit the nail right on the head i've i've wanted to give uh ryan pace the benefit of the doubt on so many things but for every really good thing he does there's an equal boneheaded thing he does you know, you draft, uh, you know, Leonard Floyd, who's turning out to be pretty good, but then you draft Kevin White. And you can't fully fault him on Kevin White because bro, how do you know somebody's going to break a bunch of bones every season? Um, but, uh, you know, you go out and you you make a trade for Akeem Hicks, who looks terrific. Um, but then you go out and you sign Marcus Wheaton and uh, Marcus Cooper – to be two of your big name acquisitions in the off season. And both those guys had what combined four snaps this past week. Yeah. Yeah. On a, on a terrible bears team. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. I just, what, what, what are the, what is going through their minds? That's what I want to know. How does, how does every media person and fan see it, but the team's actually running the team not? I just, I, that boggles my mind. I really want to walk up. Have you ever seen the movie Office Space? Oh, of course. Many times. I really want to have the Bobs go in there and, and talk to the Bears coaching staff in front office. and just be like, What is it you say you do here? <laughs> <laughs> and then then you walk out and burn it down I'm a people person <laughs> I deal with the customers <laughs> <laughs> and then i read somewhere that apparently the bears did a fan survey at, and i don't know if it was planned for this timing but it was after the bears lost to the packers how do you think the fans feel how do you think they feel Oh, we're just I mean, fine totally because 1985 happened and we're still living on that. We're just fine. Yeah, I, I get the, you know, I'm totally back getting fan input and, and wanting to make their experience better because they're your customers. But you, you just, you just have, if you don't realize embarrassing losses, and this was an, this was, it doesn't matter what the score was. This was an absolute embarrassing loss. Losing this game in any way, involved. shape, or form is bad. Yeah, this was an absolute embarrassing loss. And if you have to ask the fans how they feel after an embarrassing loss, then you are not fit to own this team. And if Virginia McCaskey, in her you know last year, in her twilight years, and this is not a a dig of anything is just, you know, she's like 95 years old is human beings only live a certain length of time is in her lat twilight years. If she wants to honor her father's memory, she should sell this team while she is still in charge. Yeah, that's my wish. That's my dream. Unfortunately, it doesn't sound like that's going to happen, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I was thinking the other day and uh, this was one kind of little almost monologue I want to say about the situation. Now I hate comparing 
football and baseball a lot because they're two totally different sports. But let's let's compare how the Cubs function and how what we know the Bears function and lack thereof. So we the Cubs have an owner. The owner says to his president of operations and general manager, you are in charge of all baseball activities. If you come to me and say you want to make a trade or sign somebody or do this, I will back you because I trust you because your job is to manage the baseball aspect of this franchise. With the Bears, you have this whole clash of coaches, GMs, and owners, and we don't even know exactly who is in charge of what anymore. It's all a jumbled mess. The Cubs right now have adopted a winning attitude. It's gotten them a World Series and three trips to the Championship Series. The Bears, you know, what's what's their attitude? What's their what what's their outlook? What's what's their culture like? What's their philosophy? There are so many things that they're so secretive about and we don't know that it, it just looks like they're covering up a big mess when you have clashes of different, you know, heights of hierarchy go, coming and making different decisions for ultimately the same team. That gets messy. Bad things happen. The Cubs are organized. They have a winning outlook. The Bears are not very organized. And they don't have a winning attitude. They just don't. No, they don't. And... I, it's it's so frustrating that to watch this team, uh, and and we got a question um, about John Fox's future and um, let me get the actual wording. And after the lackluster performance yesterday, is there now more of an urgency that we have an offensive minded coach? And what are potential options? Uh, I mean, the options right now are pretty limited. Um, is Either the Bears uh, let John Fox finish out the season and you fire him in the offseason on, on that Black Monday, or they fire him right now and they let Vic Fangio serve as the interim head coach. And uh, you get uh, you basically get a half a season as a job interview to see how Vic Fangio will will fare as, as a head coach. You know, this is my... I mean, those are... Those are this is my opinion on that that whole thing that you just mentioned, and I, I don't know if you share it, but I'm all for making the can, the fire, right now. What do you got to lose? Your season's lost. And I think by doing that, it would at least show that the Bears have some balls to show that they are meaning business here, saying that we don't tolerate this anymore. We don't have any more patience with this. At least have the guts to do something. That's my opinion. That That is much better than a survey to the fans asking how they feel after an embarrassing loss to their biggest rival um, on their home field. Is That would send... That is better than a survey. Absolutely. Is, you say, is, is, you know, Ryan Pace and George McCaskey and Virginia McCaskey, you're saying, listen, we, we understand how you feel because we feel just as bad we had to let him go and we're we're starting afresh here and i, I and you know Vic Fangio I th- wants to be a head coach he's he's interviewed for jobs um and this gives him that opportunity and you either say you know what he's doing a pretty good job then we bring in a a real offensive coordinator in the off season hire him uh or we uh you know move a different direction i mean but uh, ideally, I would like to see them. I mean, this doesn't happen very often, but is finding a head coach that's willing to accept Vic Fangio as the defensive coordinator. Um, I mean, historically, it has happened. Is you know keeping a coordinator when you're a new head coach, but not all that often. And look, you know what? This I would rather see the Bears not function properly if they did an interim type thing the rest of the year, then saying status quo, because at least again, they'd have the guts to make a change right now. And they would show us that they understand that status quo is not good enough. 
Actions speak more than words. I don't want to hear that old Virginia is pissed. I don't want to hear George McCaskey is disappointed and nothing changes. If you are truly unhappy with the way things are going, you step up and you make a change. Because the Chicago Bears are all about catch you later, later never comes. Do something. Grow a pair. Show us you care. Yeah, I, I fully back everything you said there. And if if I was had any power at all, John Fox would have been fired uh, before he made it home from that game. He had been in his car and got a call. Adios, don't come back. You know, I was I was wondering if I was going to wake up this morning and see that he was gone. You know, I, I I woke up and I looked at my phone and you know there was nothing. Uh, but you know, part of me was wondering if it was going to happen. Um, I mean, you know, hear me out for a second. Mm -hmm. so I read a story the other, maybe last week or the week before that Gary Kubiak wants to come back into the NFL as an offensive coordinator. He doesn't want to be a head coach anymore because he had to step down to his health problems. And, um, you know, he said he's, he wants to come back as a, as a coordinator is, you know, what if, what if you fire Fox. You give Fangio the chance. Fangio does a good job and you you reach out to Gary Kubiak, you know, in that interim and say, "Hey, we would like to bring you in the fold. See how you guys work together." And and then jettison Dal Logan's, you know, right in the off season, you know, and smoothly transition over to Gary Kubiak. Why the heck not at this point? Again, why not? The only, like like I said, try anything now, but don't stay status quo because that's the worst thing you can do right now. And it's, this is this is not even a knee jerk. This is not a knee jerk reaction. No, this it's not. is a this is something that's been coming for a long time. Is I don't think anybody was overjoyed about John Fox being the head coach. I think that was sort of forced down Ryan Pace's throat a little bit. Um, I think it and, was too. Because uh, they were like, we're not going to have, you know, a 30 something year old uh, general manager. And then on his first day of the job, have him start looking by himself at head coaches. I think they wanted to get his feet wet. And they were like, you know, this is a safe bet. And. It was just a bad safe bet. Uh, and now, now it's his time and you can't, and I don't think it's fair to fire Ryan Pace without giving him a chance to bring in his own head coach. I agree. I think you have to, I think you have to. even, even if, you know, part of this is not bringing enough talent and not doing enough things was, is his fault is I think you can't fire a guy until you've got, let him surround himself with his people a hundred percent. And I, I don't think John Fox was his. I think it was handed to him. Um, and yeah, it's it's what it sounds like. I think you got to let him bring in his own guy. And you know, if they're not going to go that route of firing, uh, firing uh, um, John Fox is. I mean, I think best case scenario is you you bring in somebody that is an offensive mind and is willing to say, hey, you know what, Vic Fangio and his staff are seasoned professionals. I'd love for all of them to stay on, all of them, and they stay on. That would be best case scenario. And, um, you know, somebody asked, or, you know, there was a question of who would be possible replacements. And I just, you know, I did, this is not an in-depth list at all. Um, I didn't, I didn't have a ton of chance to, to, you know, to really look into it, but the first names that came to my mind uh, were Josh McDaniel, offensive coordinator of New England, and I'm not that high on him because, uh, you know, typically the the Bill Belichick tree of of uh, coaches doesn't fare well, and Josh Daniels had a had a rough time the last time he replaced uh, John Fox. Oh no, he, John Fox replaced him, didn't he? Or was it the other way around? I'd have to. I, I don't remember. Whatever. But I know when what you're saying. I know what you're talking yeah. about. When, yeah. When he was in Den when he was in Denver, Josh Daniels had a rough time. Yeah. Um. The other name I had was uh, 
Frank Reich, who is the Eagles offensive coordinator and former NFL quarterback. That that Eagles team is cruising on offense. <sighs> you could say that again. Uh, so that's a possibility. Um, Dave Tobe, the former Bears special teams coach and the current special teams coach for uh, the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, he's interviewed numerous times for head coaching jobs. I think he's due for one. He's a very smart football man. He's shown he knows the game. Um, and, you know, there's uh, there's not a ton of precedence of, for special teams coaches being good head coaches, but uh, John Harbaugh and Mike Didka come to mind. Yeah. Now, there, there's a lot of talk about John Harbaugh um, or – Jim Harbaugh, I should say. Sorry, not John Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh and whole leaving Ann Arbor. Um, I don't know if that's on your list, is it? No, I because I I really really don't think John Harbaugh. I'm um, Jim Harbaugh. Sorry, John Harbaugh is, was the special teams coach that went on to win a Super Bowl with the Ravens. Still there, uh, but Jim Harbaugh. I don't see him leaving Michigan. I don't even though that. I think probably. Bears would be another job he would be interested in because he played for the Bears for a long right. time. And um, but I think I think until he achieves what he wants to achieve in Ann Arbor, I don't see him leaving. I agree. He's with got you. he's got so much he's making so much money. Uh he's he's loves the job, he's very happy, and he's already starting to turn the program around. Um and I just, I just don't see him leaving. I think that's a pipe dream. I think that was, that was as much of a pipe dream as when the Bears were trying to find new head coach, and they kept saying, uh, "Oh, you know, uh, Gruden's going to come out of the, the the press box and come coach, or or uh, um, what's his name? They used to coach the Steelers is going to come out of the press box and and be the Bears head coach, and all those were just pipe dreams. Is, yeah, like, look at real things." No, I'm totally with you on that. Um, let's see what I have. Two more names on my list. One is as ridiculous as this sounds. Jim Bob Cooter, the offensive coordinator for the Lions. You know, a lot of people are kind of high on that guy, and I think that he's done a pretty nice job on, from the offensive standpoint. Uh, not gonna lie, I, I I've thought about that name as well a couple of times, and plus, it's fun to say. Yeah. He, <laughs> yeah, he's got a, he's got a terrible name, but it's uh he's a, he's a really smart guy and and I'm looking at I mean honestly I'm I'm thinking Ryan Pace with how young he is and he's got a young quarterback that's a high draft pick. I really think he's going to try to find a young off offensive mind to be the head coach next. And um Jim Bob Cooter how old is he? He's got to be right around 40, maybe. Um, Jim Bob. Uh, oh, God. He's naming that. He's 33. Yo, he doesn't look that young. <laughs> um, but Jim Bob Cooter, yeah, he's 33 years old. And he's, you know, you've seen the offense for the Lions look so much better. Uh, then, then you've seen him looking a long time, and and a big part of that is Jim Bob Cooter has that, you know, Matt Stafford playing, um, playing really well. Uh, he finally focused a lot of that that talent he had. Uh, and the last name on my list is Matt Nagy, the uh, offensive coordinator for for the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. He's he's young too. He's only thirty nine, um, and he's got a funny story. Is he uh, he was a quarterback at University of Delaware, where um, what's his name from uh, the Ravens is uh, Joe Flacco is from, and he uh, ended up playing uh, for the New York Dragons of the Arena Football League, um, and the Carolina Cobras, the Georgia Force, and the Columbus Destroyers uh, in the AFL. And then he went on and started coaching high school, not even head coaching. He was like offensive coordinator. And um, he he started 
becoming a coaching intern for the Eagles. And when Kevin Cobb got injured in 2009, they tried to sign him to be the backup quarterback and the uh, NFL, you know, botched their, uh, they nixed the contract. Um, but they, uh, the Eagles decided to promote him to, uh, from an intern to a, an assistant coach. And he, then he got promoted to offensive quality coach. Um, and then Andy Reed brought him over with Kansas city and named him the head coach. So he's really learned under Andy Reed and Andy Reed's a very smart guy. I, I, I was like going to say Reed. you're learning under one of the best and you learn from the, I mean, you got groomed. I, I mean, that's another name. He's 39 years old. Um, uh, these are all young guys. I mean, Frank Reich's 55, so that's a little bit old, but uh, Dave told by things in his fifties too, but you know, mostly these are young guys. Uh, Ryan Pace is a young guy. Um, I, I think you just I th- think that's the direction he's going to go. Um, and those are some of the better offensive minds in, in this league. And that's really what you need to focus on is building talent around a young quarterback. And that's something you can re- quickly do is, you know, the, the best thing is Cam Meredith is going to come back next year and be able to play. Because he got hurt so early, right? He's going to be back. He's going to be back, you know, for training camp. Um, and then you can you have all this money to sign people. You're gonna have a high draft pick. Is you can quickly turn this around. As yeah, far exactly. As bringing talent in. You, you you draft a few. You sign a guy. You have some returning guys from injury. Like yeah, you said, it's you can do it. Yeah, you can absolutely do this, and uh, you know it's it's not going to be easy. But you you need you need a coach that can that can mold these guys and and really you know uh, bring in a winning attitude. And it, you know, and, and and the one nice thing about bringing in a young head coach, somebody that's under forty or right around forty, is that they're more likely to want to keep a guy like. Of Vic Fangio, because they're like, listen, I respect the hell out of you and what you do, and it's really great. I want to keep you on here, and you know, you keep you maintain a quality defensive staff, and then you actually bring in an offensive mind, and that's how you start winning football. Yeah, and I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Ryan Pace the coming off season, uh, whether it's looking at new coaching for the future, whether it's filling in the holes, further developing a Trubisky. I mean, there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of pressure on him. I'll, I'll tell you that. Yeah. He's got to do the right thing. And I think if you fire John Fox now, I think it actually takes the pressure off of you. If you think if you wait the whole season is I agree. things are going to get, things are going to get worse. The fire is going to get hotter and you're going to have a lot more, a lot more people with pitchforks and torches at your door than than you would if you fired him and said, "Listen, we understand you're not happy because we're not happy. We're doing something." Is you know we've got the whole rest of the off of the season plus the off season to try to figure out what we want, what we're going to do. But right now we've made the decision that we're going that direction and we're giving Vic Fangio the chance to see what he can do. That's just that's I I want to I'm waiting for that to happen even though I'm scared it won't. I want that to happen. That's exactly what I want to see. I want to see this team take action right now, show they care and not just say it like I ranted about earlier. Show you care by doing something. And you know what? Let's say Fangio does a really good job, then that makes Ryan Pace look really good. And if he doesn't do that great of a job, at least you say they made an attempt to make an immediate change. And that is something that we have not seen the Bears do in this kind of situation. I I couldn't even tell you when they did do that. So do it. You are not playing for the playoffs. You're not going to be close to the playoffs. You only lose more by staying where you're at. Any action, it, it, it does better for you. So just do it. Absolutely. Um, I don't really have anything else more I want to talk about the Bears. Um, do you want to talk about the Blackhawks or do you just want to call it a night? 
oh, there's a few things I'd like to say. Um, before we get to the Blackhawks, um, I got a text request from one of my good friends. Uh, John uh, loves the show, loves listening to us. Uh, just bringing up the whole Nikola Miritic stuff with the Bulls. And uh, I don't know if you heard about it. He was in practice today, but he still didn't interact or look at Bobby Portis. I don't know if you heard about that. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. They were both at the Burgos Center working out. And uh, wait, I think I think the guys over at Ball tweeted that out the best. Um, is Casey Johnson uh, tweeted out a quote from John Paxson that said, the reality is you can't make a trade just to make a trade. And the guys from Ball tweeted back, nah, that's the reality when your player breaks another teammate's face. One's got to go. <laughs> and is <laughs> that is absolutely correct. Is, oh. is, you know, this is a toxic situation right now. Is Miritich may have started it all. I, I don't know. I wasn't there. But Bobby Portis brought the heat. Broke Nikolai Miritich's face, and Miritich basically said, "You got to choose him or me." And the team all said, "Well, we're going to choose Bobby Portis." You know, that's got to make you feel crappy. Yeah. And, and part, <laughs> I think, part of it was that you know they he he forced everybody to choose, and they saw Bobby Portis saying, "You know, hey, I screwed up." I did something wrong. I'm trying to be a man about it. And Miritich is acting like, I mean, I don't, I mean, I probably wouldn't want to, you know, I'd probably be pretty mad too if somebody broke my face and I had to hang out with him and, and deal with him every day in and day out. That probably takes a lot to, to look past, but you know, he, he forced out everybody else to make a decision and they, apparently they made a decision. So I don't know how, I don't know how you bring Miritich back. Um, I don't even know when he's scheduled to come back. Yeah, because he just started doing like uh, workouts because the team said that they had to have him come back and try to reinstate himself with the team. And there was the report that he was having civil conversations with a couple team members. And uh, obviously Portis was not one of them because it emphasized how he never interacted with Portis, but that's the goal right now. And it seems like the Bulls are set on keeping both. And look, Miritich can't play on the same team as a guy and completely avoid him. You just can't do that. That's not possible. Um, whether he's in practice or eventually comes back, you're going to have to face him eventually. And I get that he's upset about having his jaw broken and a concussion. I get that. And I also get that Bobby Portis wants to mend the relationship. And, you know, there's a little bit of conflict there of, of feelings and whatnot. But at the end of the day, this is just a really big, just, it's it's a mess. And it's a lot of dumb drama. And it's unnecessary drama uh, because, you know, the altercation happened in the first place. You, you don't want to see that happen with your team. But unfortunately, it did happen. And this isn't going to go away with any ease. No, uh, this team, it's like I said, it starts from ownership all the way down to players punching players is this is a dumpster fire of a team and it doesn't matter if they get the number one overall pick because they're so bad that they're going to screw that up. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's that makes it even more frustrating. But hey, All-Star Game 2020 at the United Center, get hyped. That's true. I'll probably try to get tickets, but um, you know, it's the Bulls won't have anybody in it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what everyone else is saying. It's maybe at their venue, but you won't see really many Bulls faces in that. But yeah, I mean, you just you're trying to rebuild, you're in year 1 of a rebuild, and the fact that you're having to deal with this it's just, ugh, it's just bad, and when to see your vice president say you're not going to trade someone just to trade someone, it's like, well, I get that you want them to work out, and I get that you both want to have them on your team, but when you think about it, is it really worth it? Nico Miracic has struggled. Uh, other teams didn't want to sign him, so why why do you want to keep him around so badly? I that's what I'd like to know. I think I think they're. I mean, if he really thinks that 
they are going to mend this fence, then they're dumb. Um, it, the only the only saving grace could be if they're trying to publicly say this to so they have some bit of leverage to trade him. Uh, right, that's the only thing. But they signed Miritich basically so they had uh, they met the this NBA salary floor, so they had to have a pay a certain amount, you know, total in salary, and they didn't have enough. So they just paid it all to Miritich. Um, so he's not a guy that fits this team, what they're doing going forward. So who cares? Just trade him. It's just, you know, it's NBA. You have to have similar salaries. So you take on somebody else's garbage overpaid player, and maybe you at least get somebody that fits in there. And if not, you just don't have that distraction anymore. So trade him for a bag of balls for all I care. If, if you can't get a good trade, just you just get him out so you don't have this conflict anymore. He's happy. Portis is happy. Everyone's happy. Yeah. You know, let let it be. Move move on. Is You didn't want Miritich anyway. Is You can find somebody that's probably just way overpaid, that had a bad contract, but can at least give you some solid minutes that you can trade Miritich for. Uh, so who knows? We'll see. Yeah. That's really all I had to say say about that on the Bulls. But, uh, yeah, uh, shout out to my uh, friend John, who's a regular listener and uh, enjoys our content and asking us uh, some questions to answer. Yeah, that's about as, all you can say about a team that's won two games so far this season. They do have that, two wins. For some reason, I thought they only had one. They have two, and no other team has less than two. Wow. So. They some a few other teams have more than two nine losses, but they have the least number of wins. So that's they'll go bulls. Hey, you know, I'll, I'll give them credit for this. They've had some really nice tank wins where you see guys like Markinen play good games and uh, help them, you know, kind of move things around, but still losing. I mean, that's quality tanking right there. True, true. I just don't want to see Markinen get hurt. He's already got some ankle injuries and some shoulder injuries. Guys play 13 games. Yeah, I mean, he's fun to watch. And, you know, right now he's your best asset that's healthy right now. So you got to take that as something. And you, I like his attitude. I like the way he plays. Uh, so, you know, uh, other than him right now, there's just nothing really interesting to watch. And, you know, I'll be honest, I haven't even watched a full game yet this season. I've watched maybe two, three quarters worth of the first 13 games. That's about yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I try to watch at least a quarter of each game, and it's hard sometimes. It's hard sometimes. It's not even – It's we thought this would be fun bad. It's not really even fun bad. No, I, it's really not. Um, it's, it's frustrating because they're not – I think it could be fun bad. It's just, I think they're they're still playing the wrong players. They got to figure out who the players are that you know you got to give your minutes to, and and I just don't think they're they've found that right mix yet. No, they haven't. And you know it's a long season, but and you're going to get some guys returning from injury. Uh, Zach Levine being the big one, but uh, yeah, no, you're definitely right about that. Um, so, and we'll see what happens to, like, the only veteran on the team, a.k.a. Uh, Robin Lopez. You see if they flip him or not. Uh, you know, obviously he's probably the best overall player on the team, considering Glory Markin, and as good as he is, he's, you know, a rookie, and he's still learning a lot. But, you know, it, it's like there's no one on that squad above 30, and the ones who are above 25 are guys you forget about, like, uh, what is it? Quincy Pondexter from the Clippers. Oh, yeah. Like, I didn't even know who that guy was when he came over. I'm like, who the heck is that? Yeah, I was watching one game. I'm like, I don't remember this guy. <laughs> I don't remember him. Yeah, I mean, especially when both Portis and Nico were gone. And you're like, okay, there's Laurie Markinen. Okay, there's Robin Lopez. Okay, there's Jerry and Grant. Okay, there's Justin Holiday. Who are the rest of these guys? It's just it's a band of misfit toys. Who's um? There's a one guy. Uh, oh yeah, Paul Zipser. 
I there's the other guy kind of kind of know. He really just I mean, last year you had some hope for him. This year he's just been Yeah, last year he wasn't that bad. Yeah, this year he's just been non-existent. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I I'm not going to watch much Bulls this year. There's there's just no reason for me to. Yeah, absolutely. I just it's it's frustrating. And I think it's just going to get worse. <laughs> Which we expect, which is expected. The Hawks, on the other hand, that's a bit more frustrating. Yes. So the Hawks, since uh, since last time we talked, have had three games. Um, they had the absolute stinker against the, the Flyers. Um, the overtime win, which they still struggled in uh, against Carolina. Well, that's because Carolina's no good. And then... They uh they blew the lead against the Devils. That that game really really pissed me off. That second period was some of the worst. That is the worst I've seen the Blackhawks play in years. You know they were uh one goal away. The Devils were one goal away from matching. Their high scoring from 2005. Yeah, this it was a bad, bad period. I mean, the Hawks started out. That was, you know, the Hawks' MO lately has been starting slow, then heating up at the later in the first period, having a stinker of a second period, and then either trying to play catch up or trying to play hold on for the third. And this one, they actually started off pretty quick. They was, you know, they were up four to two in the first period, and you had to feel pretty good. They were four to one at one point. Yeah, you had to feel feel pretty good in the first period, but you finally had Corey Crawford. When they scored the fourth goal, I'm like, all right, cool, blowout win, let's go. Yeah, Corey Crawford, and we've been saying this is you can't rely on Corey Crawford playing, you know, like the best goalie ever for for the whole season and Corey Crawford really came back down to earth in this game. Yeah. I mean, going into that game, he led the league in save percentage and he led the league in goals against average. I mean, he's been phenomenal this year and he's due for a bad game. And you know what, when he's having a bad game, when the defense looks really bad, that's not a good formula. And that showed last night. Yeah. uh, um, You know, the defense has really struggled in this stretch, really struggled. Uh, Corey Crawford, even when he's playing well, is getting a lot of A plus chances that he's had. To, he has to fight off. Um, yep. And for the most part, is the offense has been pretty stagnant. Um. And then the one game they score five goals, they give up seven. So go figure. Yeah. Um, the game against Carolina, you you had uh, Alex DeBrinket. Looked, it was kind of his like breakout game. He looked really good after a slow start here. Looked awesome. And and you also really lucked out in that game because Carolina was on the power play quite a bit, and they just couldn't capitalize on anything. They looked so um, anemic on on the power play. Yeah, I mean, again, that was a game the Hawks kind of won because Carolina is kind of bad. True. Um, and then that game against Philadelphia, that was probably, I mean, that one infuriated me for multiple reasons. One, my wife's a Flyers fan, but two, it was, <laughs> uh, it was a really slow start. Um, you had, uh, defensive breakdowns. Um, you had a bad break with the, the puck going off the official skate. Um, you know, it was supposed to be the big breakout of the the sharp Taves and Kane line. And that was so bad that they nixed that after what, what one period. Um, you couldn't stop the Flyers top line at all. Uh, the only positive about that is Connor Murphy finally scored a goal. whoop de do Which that kind of gets me to a point I wanted to ask you really quick before I forget. Y- you talked about uh, Connor Murphy and uh, Jan Ruda. I mean, it's funny. They seem more productive when it comes to scoring, but when it comes lately, at least, it seems like they're better at scoring than they are at defense. Yeah. Um, I mean, really, that's that. It's true. 
I just I just don't know what else to, to say about this team. Uh, they they lack a sense of urgency. I know it's still early in the season, but you know they lack a sense of urgency. Mm-hmm. Uh, they look. I mean, it, it's early, but it, once November is over and we're getting to December, next thing you know, it's going to be the halfway point. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you can't. Uh, there's just there's got to be a point where you say, you know, we've got to play better and actually go out there and and execute. Um, you know, they've you, every time you say, well, they've got a couple of days off, maybe they're gonna figure some things out or come back with a f- fire in their belly, and then they come out flat from that. And that's the frustrating part. Is the Flyers game was after a couple of days off and they yeah. came out flat. Yeah, exactly. They had what three days off going to that game, yep. and they just came out. And I mean, that was that was a horribly played hockey game. Yeah, it was really bad. And and you know, right now the Blackhawks, uh, one, two, three, four, like they are they are tied with one, two, three, four, or three other teams for that last playoff spot. I think. Uh, let me see playoffs. Uh, a wild card. Um, yeah, so Cal- right now it will be wild cards would be Calgary and Dallas, and Vancouver and and the Blackhawks are be outside looking in. Yeah, um, you know we talked about earlier how there's. There's no absolute force in the West, but I think there are enough good teams where the Hawks really have to start picking things up here and not just kind of rely on everyone everyone around them being mediocre. I mean, there are some competitive teams in the West, and they, they got to pick things up eventually. And when you see a lot of the similar problems night in, night out, for the past few years when things have gone bad, we've all gone to the, oh, they'll figure things out. They always do, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, that was true for a long time. But right now, I don't know if things will get much better. Maybe they will, but I just I can't guarantee it right now because we're seeing a lot of the same problems over and over again. And I, I hate to say it, but our veteran defensemen, They're great players, but they're getting old. They've got tons of miles on them, and it just looks like they can't keep up anymore, which, you know, that happens when you play so much so much extra hockey. Um, that's just that's what happens. And like we've said before, teams are beating us with speed. And I don't I don't think people fear the Blackhawks like they once did. Um, again, maybe things do turn around. I'm I'm not writing the season off, but I will say this: I would not be surprised if things kind of don't get much better with the way things are looking right now. But I'm not saying it. Yeah, won't. I mean Seabrook has looked bad for most of the season. Duncan Keith, yeah, has has you know uh, he's looked okay, but far from what he was a couple of seasons ago and right he's not the Norris trophy yeah, winner that we've we know. seen you've seen him get beat by people that he would never have gotten beat like that a couple of years ago uh this the speed just isn't there like it was um and uh oh yeah I mean he it's not like he forgot how to play it's just you know the the wheels have slowed down a little bit um and and again, that's what happens with age when you play all that yeah, hockey. Absolutely, I, I and I, I you have to believe that if the Blackhawks don't figure this out and at least make a really deep run for the Stanley Cup, that there's a good possibility Quenville is is no longer the Blackhawks coach after this season. That's got to, yeah. I mean, you got to weigh that possibility. I mean, that has to be a really realistic possibility. But uh, considering the some of the volatility between um uh the general manager and and the head coach that the head coach if he's not performing is going to be you know ousted and this the way they're playing if you know if they the eke into the playoffs or they're outside looking in from the end of the season that's that is not acceptable you know for this 
this team. They have expectations that are way too high. Right. With all the success they've had and all the good things that they've had. And, you know, the, the frustration with the Blackhawks is absolutely nothing like the Bears. Because the Blackhawks, you say, we saw them be one of the best and most successful franchises of this decade. The Bears, the exact opposite. And the Blackhawks, you say, well, things aren't looking good. And maybe things will get better. Maybe they won't. Um you know, it, it'll be a little harder to accept if things don't get better because we've been so good for a decade now. But at least you know that you had a lot of success recently and you understand why things would start to falter a little bit. You understand that players don't last forever. You understand that coaches always have an expiration date no matter where you are, who you are, and what sport you play. It's tougher to accept, but you can understand it. You don't want to say goodbye to the good times, but it's not like you're saying, well, they're bad because they're bad. No, they're bad. You know, they're not doing as well because, you know, after years of wear and tear and teams figuring you out, you know why it happens, even though it's harder to accept, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, Bill Walsh that won a bunch of Super Bowls as a 49ers head coach. Um, he wrote a book and he, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact way he, he said the quote, but, um, it was something along the lines that, uh, you know, after five years or whatever coaches abilities with a team, you know, their success starts to wane. Uh, you have, you have a certain shelf life and if you, you know, even if you are a successful coach and there's nothing wrong with your coaching ability, at some point your ability to lead these guys gets stagnant <clears throat> and and it's time to make a change. Maybe it's 10 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. And again, this isn't like, I, I, th I don't think you're saying, and I know I'm not saying, you know, fire Quenville right now like we want John Fox. No, that's not the case. What my point is, is that this season is extremely telling of the future. If things stay where they are and this team just looks mediocre, then yeah, I think it absolutely is time for a change. For all we know, they could turn it on in the second half and they win another Stanley Cup and, you know... Our criticism early on ends up looking stupid and for not. But, 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 I think some Hawks fans have to realize that things may not get better and that you have to be prepared for all scenarios. You can be confident all you want, and that's fine. Have all the confidence in the world. There's nothing wrong with having confidence. But some people do have to realize, I think, that you know, it, it, there is a possibility that it won't. And if that time comes, you know, we got to be ready for some changes. That's that, that's just how it's going to be. But, you know, by all means, if you're fully confident in this team, then be fully confident in this team. They've done a lot of good things, and I understand it. But if things don't get better, then expect some changes. And I just think right now it's realistic for Hawks fans to look at both scenarios, not just one or the other. Yeah. And, and you know, this is the NHL. I just, I don't think Quenville is a, a bad coach or done by any stretch. I think it just has a shelf life and, and you see so much in the NHL, especially, uh, you know, recycling of coaches and he's going to end up, you know, if the Blackhawks do let him go, he's going to go somewhere else. And, do well with that program and the Blackhawks are going to bring in somebody else that's going to reinvigorate the roster that they have and, you know, see some results. <clears throat> it's just the, the, the way, the way the world works in hockey. And you know what? It's going to happen eventually. Maybe it's next year. Maybe it's in a few years, but eventually it is going to happen. And nothing can take away what Joe Quenville has done when we look back at Joe Quenville's career, we're going to think of those cups. We're going to think of that success first and foremost. But, you know, like you said, shelf life. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, absolute shelf life. Um... Now, here's my last question of the night for you. How long do we have until we say 
things are not going to get better. If how how long do things have to say status quo for us to say that if things don't get better? No, oh, I think this, this season. Uh, wait, how long in this season before we can just right? Like, how long in this season do we have? I think it just depends on how media. I mean, if they if they are meandering around the the wild card spot. You know, it could go all the way up to the end. I mean, till the last weekend of the season. Um, but like 2011. Yeah. But if, and I think that's probably how it's going to be. I mean, me, unless, yeah, you know, I, I just, I just don't see them turning it on. I think they're gonna, they're just gonna be in that, that middle of the pack teams that, um, right on the cusp of the playoffs, and a couple of them will go in, a couple won't. I, I don't see them making this run to to win the division or or be a surefire playoff team. It would take for them to get really hot in teams like the Blues, the Predators, and other teams to not play that well. Yeah, and I, I just I don't see that many teams not playing well. And and I was funny. I was joking with I somebody agree. else's. You know, it would be funny to, if Quenville was gone at the end of the season and then they bring in Daryl Sutter. <laughs> you know, I actually had that same thought the other day. I was thinking about that. I mean, it's another guy that uh, he's still got a lot of coaching years left in him. He's he's in his 50s. Um, he's He knows what it's like to win a Stanley Cup. He won two yeah, at the Kings. I mean, he had that team. A team that wasn't even that flashy. Yeah, he, he had that team humming. So, you know, he said he's, he wants to coach again. And he's waiting for the right fit. <laughs> I think having a team with Kane and Taves and Crawford is probably a pretty darn good fit for most people. I definitely agree with that. Absolutely. Um, I think also in this Blackhawks season, one thing that has really, really caught my eye is the fact that I just uh, I don't I don't see them oh how do I say this 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 is just kind of me rambling and this is me just kind of talking how I see the team I just don't see the same energy from both their surroundings and the team for all those years they did all those silly little things the little videos pranks and you saw a lot of energy from them. I just don't see it anymore. Yeah, absolutely. It's just flat. Yeah, that's how I describe it. Flat. And, you know, I just... I, I hate seeing it, but that's just kind of how I describe it right now. And, you know, I, I hate sounding like negative, negative, negative when it comes to it. But, you know, with the way they've played this year outside the first two games, you know, I can't say I'm overly overly confident that they're gonna turn into the best team in the nhl even though i also say i'm not throwing away the season just yet because it's too early to do that but i, I i'm just not counting on that big run like you said and i think that for something like that to happen something drastic would have to happen and i just don't know if it is uh, yeah I, i'm right there with you i think this is going to be another dud season uh after some the beginning of the season it looked great. Um, Patrick Sharp has just not looked good. You've seen a lot of a lot of older guys not playing where you need them to play, um, and it, there's no reinforcements coming. Uh, this is just you have what you have, and um, you know it, it's it's up to Quinville to make it work. I, I want to just, I really don't want to anger the Patrick Sharp crowd. And look, Patrick Sharp was my favorite player um, from 2009 to like 2014 when he was in his prime. He was my favorite Blackhawk. And I will always think of Patrick Sharp as one of my favorite Blackhawks. But if this lack of production continues, I almost think you got to say thanks, but we're going to go more with some of our younger guys. Like, I really think, um, I personally, I want to see Vinny Hinnestroza up again because I really like what this kid has. Um, and, you know, right now, Sharp just, 
I know he's got a good attitude about it, and he says he wants to keep working, and he's in good shape, and I credit him, but you know what? If there just continues to be a lack of production from wherever he plays, whatever line he plays, I think you might have to make a choice and just say, let's go with some younger guys and start to, you know, maybe healthy scratch him every now and then and play somebody else or... You know, make make a decision with him. And again, I don't. I'm not trying to anger the Patrick Sharp crowd here, but that's just that's how I feel. And you know, you look at a lot of the guys who've come back second time around with the Hawks uh, when Stan Bowman's reunited someone. It hasn't always gone particularly well, and that's just because a lot of those guys are are older and they're at the tail ends of their careers. It's, it's true. <laughs> nothing, nothing really to add to that. It's that's true. Um, I, yeah, I, you know, I, it's not like this season. It's not like Duncan Keith's gonna get faster, or Brent Seabrook's gonna get younger, or you know, Sharp's gonna yeah, get younger. Sharp's gonna get younger. It, it's <laughs> it's you got what you got, and um, you know, I, you're gonna have to start relying on on younger guys to come up and make big plays. Um, you know, Brandon, Brandon odd. Like I said, I this. want Hinnestroza back up. Yeah. Uh, I, it, it, somebody, somebody's got to step up and, and maybe, maybe it's going to be Alex to that starts playing well, but I mean, he's, he's looked yeah, better these, recently. You know, these last three games actually he's looked much better. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be patient with the because, you know, he he's young. He's what, 19, 20 years yeah. old? Straight from the juniors. You know, he's going to take some time to get in there. And uh, I, I think the way he's playing lately is really showing uh, the potential he has. So I, I'm a bit patient with him. I, I'll admit that. So, you know, you, you want to see more from him. One player that I think has been kind of disappointing this year, and I, other people have said it, guess who I'm thinking about? Compared to how he's played the past few years and this year. I don't know who you're thinking of. Richard Panic. Yeah. He's kind of disappeared. Yeah, he sort of has. I mean, before he was on the scoring line and he's been on the the, the bottom lines. But um, yeah, it's been quiet. But at least you'd, you'd see him make plays no matter what line he was on. And now just he's taken some boneheaded penalties and, you know, he's been a little quieter. And, you know, that, that kind of stinks because I really like Richard Panic, And so far as a hawk up to this point, he's been great. Yeah, he really has. Um, uh, you know, I, I maybe, you know, he's got to be on the, the top line with Taves and Saad uh, this next game. Um, yeah, try is, it. Is uh, you know, and then Anisimov. So what the the current lines are going to be is Taves, Sod, and Panic, Anisimov, Schmaltz, and Kane, uh, Lance Boma, who's actually been playing pretty well, uh, Tanner Caro, and yeah, uh, I kind of like it. Uh, Debrinket, and then the bottom line is going to be Sharp, Wingles, and and Hayden, and I'm just honestly. I think Sharp should just be a healthy scratch. Uh, let yeah, it like Christopher Stieg. He's he's like Christopher Stieg when he oh, came back. That's a good comparison. He's like a. a sh you saw plenty of healthy scratches. Yeah. Um. And. Uh, I, I just don't know what else to say. This the you know, the defensive pairings. Nothing seems to be working right. No, there's no clicking. Um, you got guys playing out of position and defensive side. Uh, you know, you're trying to you're trying to shoehorn players in, and I, I just think, I just think it's just this is this is a, a bad recipe that they've got. I don't I don't think they have bad talent. I think it's just they they don't have the right players for what Quenville is trying to do with this team. 
Yeah, and I mean, we all knew that one day these players were going to get old and slow down because that's what Father Time does. And, you know, we're seeing that with some of these guys. So, you know, some of it was inevitable. My main fear, though I don't think it's going to ever be to this degree, I just don't want to turn into a Red Wings type in the 2010s where they kind of still live on nostalgic glory and squeak into the playoffs as like the last seed every year and get bounced in the first round with a slightly above average to average record. Like I just, I don't want to be treading water like that. I don't want this team to become that. Oh, I, you know I what I mean? Yeah. Um, And I, I still think they have a lot of talent. They've got a, a lot of young talent. I, they, I think Absolutely they, just, they, they need the, they need to be less rigid with the system that they run and utilize the talent they have. And, um, you know, it, it, part of it is guys are just sloppy playing. And I don't know how, how you fix that is sloppy passing, um, mental mistakes. Some, uh, yeah. Some things you just can't coach. They That's on the players. Yeah. <sighs> I think we should just wrap this episode up. Uh, I think we've spit enough venom out. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I want to thank everyone for listening. Uh, you know, please hit subscribe. However you listen to podcasts, whether that's iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube, um, share with your friends. Uh, and if you have questions, comments, concerns, hit us up on social media at shy fan, Pat one at Swirsky sports, facebook.com slash Swirsky sports, Swirsky sports.com. And thank you so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Cubs win! What a lucky break! The good Lord wants the Cubs to win! We thank Dick and God for all they have provided. Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her, you can have her, she's a Packer fan, she can't fit in my van, and she looks like the number New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31, the negative 7. The Bears, oh, when the Bears go bearing down.